Okay, we're we're recording. Okay, well, it's nice to meet everyone. It was good to have a few minutes to chat there. Um, I am Julia Wester. Carl uh, gave a little bit of an intro, but um, I've been doing uh, processy kinds of things since I got my first management job back in, I don't know, 2009. And I had teams that were working their butts off, really smart people, and we just weren't finishing anything. And so that really began my foray into people in process puzzles. I had put away my coding and development puzzles. And I found that these were just as difficult and challenging, if not more so than the coding that I was doing. Um, so that was fun and exciting. Um, I come, I started really learning mostly about Kanban, but I've always done a mixture of Kanban and Scrum things in, in the teams that I've worked with. Um, I have a company called 55 Degrees. We are mostly a product company. Uh, we, we write actionable agile software and we, um, we publish that for JIRA, uh, Azure and as a standalone app. And we're working on some other things, but some of the other things that I do is I am also a trainer. So I train with ProConban.org and I'm on their board of advisors. And I am a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org. And I currently have the honor of being one of the course stewards for the professional scrum with Kanban class right now. Uh, it's, a, it's something that, you know, every couple of years you switch sort of shepherds and stewards of the class and you you foster it and help it grow and enable trainers. So this really fits into stuff that I think about all day long with actual agile and flow metrics and in my stewardship with scrum teams and helping them use flow metrics. And so I'm hoping today that while I will be presenting and talking about a lot of things that it can be conversational as we go and you know, just speak up if you have a thought, want to add something, have a question. Um, it doesn't need to feel all, you know, presentery. Um, but so this is what we're going to talk about: how Scrum teams can benefit from flow metrics. And in that, if I can get there. Um, the learning outcomes that I wanted us to get out of today. So you know, right now, if you want to stay for this, <laughs> hear it up front. Um, are I want people to leave understanding why Scrum teams might want to care about flow in the first place and how they could get started using some flow metrics because it might be a little bit daunting when we talk about adding flow to scrum it's very metric heavy and that can be a little you know it can put people off or be a little scary so we can talk about how you can start with some of this um, so we're obviously going to have to dive into what the four basic flow metrics are and what they tell you what questions they answer and then going into thinking about scrum and all the events in your sprints, we want to connect those dots between what the flow metrics tell you and what you want to get out of your different sprint events and see if we can put some of those things together and understand when you might use which flow metric and which sprint event. And you know, we can have some discussion around that. So that's what I'm hoping that we'll get out of today. Any questions or uh, any anybody think they were going to get something different out that we should try to fit in today? Okay, well, you can always speak up. Okay, so we're gonna start with why I manage flow in Scrum and hopefully give you a little bit of uh, a few tips to get you started the right way. The first thing that I like to think about, the way I like to start thinking about this is that remembering that Scrum sort of came to be because we have this uncertainty out in the world and started with developing software and now it's expanding farther and farther out to other areas of business because it is a helpful place when you have uncertainty and you need to get complex work done. And so they created this framework to help us have a forcing function to inspect and adapt at least every so often. So, uh, and that forcing function is the sprint. The sprint event is a container and it's a cadence and Scrum says that cadence is reduced complexity. I don't know how many of you ever um, have been in a Kanban team or something and they're saying, oh, we'll pull a retrospective when we need one or we'll pull this kind of meeting when we need one and then weeks and weeks go by 
And then when you finally decide you need one, you can't schedule it on the calendars because getting 10 people together in their room is, you know, at the same time is a crazy thing. So having this concept of cadences and pre-scheduled times where you meet at least that often to talk about things is a tremendously helpful tool. So Scrum has this inspect and adapt cadence, and it's anywhere between, you know, one, four weeks at the max, okay? And Scrum teams will commonly work in a board like this. Um, I know that we're working a lot with people in Azure DevOps right now are starting to really explore that space more. And they have boards where you can move your stories across. They've also got this area in the backlog where you basically have a task board or something like that, right? And where you've got your sprint, your PBIs, your product backlog items in your sprint backlog, but you're really tracking tasks and sub bits, you know, little subtasks across a to-do doing done board. And this is a common Scrum team board. Now we get, there's this inherent concept that we'll finish this work within our sprint, right? We hope that by doing that, we can get fast feedback because remember that cadence, that one to four weeks is so that we can inspect and adapt and we can't inspect and adapt unless we finish work to be inspected and adapted. So while there's not a firm commitment that everything must be done by the end of the sprint, there's a pretty strong ideal that you get most of it done within a sprint so that you have something to inspect and adapt. So there's this, this balance there, okay? Now, sorry, I keep clicking off of this thing. So Scrum has a inherent way of limiting work and process. When we think about Kanban, the first thing most people think of besides sticky notes on a whiteboard is limiting WIP. But Kanban is not the only place that has a mechanism to do that. It just has a different mechanism and accomplishes a bit of a different um, sort of flavor, a different value of the, the WIP at limits. So Scrum's way of limiting WIP is by you meeting every sprint and saying, I'm gonna pull this set of work into my sprint. And this is the work we're most likely gonna be focusing on during the sprint. You can pull more stuff in, you can take stuff out, but you're generally saying, this is what we're gonna focus on, okay? Now, has anybody ever, well, if you use burn down charts, does anybody ever see burn down charts that sort of look like this? I see some nodding heads. I call this the cliff of despair, right? Now, why might I call this the cliff of despair? If I was a team and my burn down charts, if I use them regularly look like this, what are some of the things that I might be feeling in that team? What do you think? If anxiety the last few days of the sprint, whether you'll actually do it or not. Yeah, I mean, nothing's finishing until the very end of the sprint, right? We have all this, all this stress we're carrying and then hopefully it all magically finishes at the end. Anything else? Brushed. Brushed, yeah. Maybe maybe we don't even do all the things that we should because we're trying to get it all done. You know, who knows? I mean, I can't tell from this chart, but I can get a good idea of if this is happening a lot, there are some things that people might be feeling. Now, there can be multiple reasons why a burn down chart might look like this. Um, one can be, you know, the size of the work items. Perhaps everything that we do is so big that it literally takes the entire sprint to do it, even if we focus on it the whole time, right? That's one thing that we can investigate. But a really, really common cause is that we don't tend to think a lot about how we execute the work that we've planned for our sprint. We just figure we'll get it all done in the end, right? And so oftentimes we'll start all of the, sprint, the product backlog items in our sprint backlog, we'll start tasks for all of them. And so we're making a lot of busy progress, but nothing completes until the very end of the sprint. And by doing bits and pieces of everything all at once, um, it's robbing a chance for us to get earlier feedback loops for some of the things that could finish earlier. Let's, let's take a look at that real quick. Yeah, we just talked about what might lead mm -hmm. to that pattern. Go ahead. 
Okay. Well, mm -hmm. in order to talk about, you know, some things that we might do, there's a special relationship that's good to understand. I'm sure many of you have heard of it before, but just to, so that we're all in the same baseline, there's this relationship called Little's Law. Okay. And it's called a law because it's this mathematical theorem that generally works out, but it's not something that you can um, put numbers in and figure out precise ways to uh, run your process and always get the perfect result. It's more of a, a mathematical equation that shows you the relationship between these three things. Cycle time, which we'll, we'll, we'll define, these are all flow metrics, by the way, and we'll define what they go into. But cycle time, how long it takes to get work done, is generally equal to uh, your average cycle time is generally equal to your average work in process or progress over your average throughput and throughput we'll talk about later but it's the rate at which you get work done so basically say we're saying how long work takes has a relationship to how many things we do at one time and how fast we finish those things and if we do anything to one it's going to affect one of the other two okay so cycle time and throughput, how long things take and how many things we get done, those are um, sort of lagging indicators. The one lever that's easier to control is the amount of things we do at one time, because that's something that we don't have to wait until something's finished. That's something that is in sort of a leading indicator, an active thing we can control uh, to improve those other two things. So what we want to do is experiment with the idea of using flow within our sprint to see if we can sort of uber experience uh, the inspect and adapt feedback loop and make it shorter and shorter, maybe even get multiple inspect and adapt feedback loops within our current sprint. Um, you know, we think, or we used to think a lot about the sprint cadence being, we deploy at the very end of our sprint, if that often, right? And we used to think of the sprint cadence as a deployment cadence or a delivery cadence, right? We have a two week sprint, so we deliver every two weeks. But now what we're really trying to promote is that people divorce the idea of the sprint cadence from the delivery cadence. And so you can deliver multiple times within your sprint but you're going to plan every couple of weeks or every four weeks, you know, somewhere in there. You're going to have a retrospective that often. You're going to, um, oh my gosh, you're going to have a review with your stakeholders that often and uh, things like that. So we don't necessarily have to couple delivering to our customers with how long our sprint is. We wanna deliver at least that often but it shouldn't hold us back from delivering more often or being able to deliver more often if we wanted to. Because um, who can tell me the end goal of a sprint? What's the output of a sprint? Does anyone have an idea? A deployable, executable, or something you can, something you can run in production. Yeah. You can it up from the last time. Absolutely, <laughs> perfect, an increment. And, um, and they've recently, you're exactly right with what you said. They recently changed the words in the Scrum Guide to a, use, a valuable usable increment. So it's something that you could deploy if you wanted to. And just a, a fun fact is that the increment isn't just the thing that you delivered that sprint mm. because you're supposed to be compounding what you've delivered before. So you have the thing as it was before and now you're adding work to that and you know, so your whole product is your increment, not just a bit of work you did this time. So we want to be able to continuously, even more often than the sprint, inspect and adapt on that increment, our, our entire product. So if and faster and getting away from the cliff of despair, we can turn, you know, that, that cliff more to something like this. It's not going to be a perfect rate of, you know, not equally match the ideal rate of completion, but, you know, get earlier feedback often, more often. Okay. But there is one catch that before we go into flow metrics and teach you how to measure stuff, I need to make sure you are thinking about measuring the right thing, because there is a bit of a trap that um, depending on how you're visualizing your work, 
you could fall into measuring uh, the wrong thing. So let's go back here to our common scrum team workboard. Now, in this workboard, if my sprint backlog items are staying here in this left column and these subtasks are moving across, what am I really visualizing the flow of here in this board? From a flow perspective. Sina? The, uh, the output rather than the outcomes. Well, it, it's, it's really that my sprint backlog items are the things that provide value when they're finished. Mm -hmm. And our tasks that we've broken out here, they're helpful for us to finish that value, but individually, they're not valuable. They're only valuable when they're completed as a group and packaged and that entire sprint backlog item is completed. And so if we're measuring and optimizing getting these little small subtasks done, mm -hmm. then we can make a chart that looks uh, like this, but is measuring the wrong thing. We can say we're getting lots of these tasks done all the way throughout the sprint if we are measuring how fast we get tasks done. But we could get to the very end of the sprint and our actual valuable item burn down chart of our sprint backlog items could still look like that cliff. So we need to think about measuring the flow of what we're actually trying to inspect and adapt. Um, so in a nutshell, measure the flow of the things that matter and what matters is our value, right? And the things that represent our value are the PBIs, the product backlog items, the things in your sprint backlog. You know, tasks are all fine and you can use them to help track your work and make sure you're doing everything. But what we really need to measure and manage the flow of is the backlog items themselves, okay? Um, there's a couple of questions that generally comes up in our training when we get to this point, mm -hmm. because um, it is a very different way of measuring work. And in one way, if I just saw this, people would be like, well, where's the visibility of all my tasks going? I had so much information with all of this tasks, okay? And so the answer is, is that they generally move to two different potential places, okay? One of them is that um, the task may move to a step in your workflow. So if you had a sprint backlog item and you had, I'm gonna use the, the overused, you know, analyze, develop tests, which I'm not suggesting that needs to be your workflow. But if your tasks were analyze, develop, test, and then once all those things were done, it was done, well, then this board becomes, here's my backlog, here's my analysis column, my dev column, and my test column, and we don't need those tasks anymore, right? So that's one possibility um, that, that we do. Um, let's see. Yeah, here's an example. So exploration, creation, validation. Um, I put these words here to help us with another point. When we get into trouble with trying to implement flow metrics and, and helping manage flow throughout a, a board, um, we get into problems when we try to equate column names with functional roles, okay? So if you're in a, if you have a Kanban board and it says analysis, development, testing, done, then a really common pattern that people will fall into is that anyone with an analyst in their title says, the, an the analysis column is my inbox. I only look at that column, that's where all my work is. The developers say that about the development column and then you know, testers about the test column. Well, one, that leads to the fact that we must maintain our silos, but then also it causes all of this unnecessary desire to move things backwards because, oh, I found a bug in test. So now I have to move it back to the development column because that's where the developers are. But what we need to think of is that the board itself is a visualization of the life cycle of the work, not a visualization of the workers that do the work, okay? So if we think that there's uh, a workflow that's 
um, backlog, exploration, creation, validation, and done, then we might think about um, a slightly different way to think about this. So the other place that tasks go besides the column names can be criteria of how to know when it can move out of that column or exit criteria. So maybe in the exploration column, we have success criteria defined, test cases written, maybe some pseudocode is being completed. So you can see here that those might be things that were tasked, broken down into, you know, in our, in our backlog items. And you can still have subtasks under here if that helps you manage all your work. You know, we just don't need to be tracking and monitoring the flow of those. Um, but you can also see here that, huh, maybe people with test in their title might have work to do in the exploration phase of a work item. Developers might have work to do in an exploration phase of a work item. We all really have to work together to get this item from backlog to creation, and here's the steps that it needs to move through. And then we say, you know, for, um, for work tracking purposes, once we finish with this set of things that need to be done, our exit criteria can move to creation. And that might be where we move the pseudocode to real code. Um, people might be working on more test scripts. Uh, and we might also say it can't move out of this until all the tests pass and builds are successful. So you could have testers and developers and maybe those are the same people, maybe they're not, but you have this whole cycle of bug fix and development going on. And then you move on to the next phase, et cetera. So what we what really helps with um, helping people understand that um, these tasks don't need to disappear, that they move to either column names or exit criteria is that you don't have to limit yourself to one column. And when you get people thinking outside of that sort of natural constraint, then it makes it so much easier to do that translation and you have so many fewer limitations on, on how you're trying to use the board. Using the board becomes so much easier because the board is about the work and people get to work all through the board. Uh, any questions about that? Because um, that's sort of a, you know, a lot of stuff that I said there. And I think it's sort of important. I've got a kind of question, but it's a bit off topic. So. Good. Um, I don't know whether you want me to hang on till the end. Um, well, how off topic is well, it? Well, <laughs> so I said it's, it's a statement and then, then a question. So this is the pattern I use at work. Um, but what we find is that once you've got the Kanban cadence in place and you've changed your scrum board to look like this, it's really hard to tell the difference. Do you find that? Or is that tell a, the difference between what? somebody a team that's nominally running at scrum and a nominally running kanban it doesn't Do matter care? i mean i don't i don't think yeah. it matters as long as your visualization is serving the people doing the work it doesn't need to look like this or look like mm -hmm. that i mean honestly you could have i really want someone to make a kanban board that looks nothing like this column columnar thing uh, oh, if that's even a word we had you a round one <laughs> So uh, I don't care what your visualization looks like as long as it's helping you manage the flow of work and you're actually managing the things that matter, which is the value. Uh, but that's a great that's a great point. Um, and in our classes all the time, we talk about we can talk about this more at the end a little bit. Um, the question always comes up. Okay, now that I've added flow, do we still need the Scrum part anymore? And I think you do, depending on the context of work you do. But we'll we'll talk about that at the end. Have you? Okay. Uh... Have you seen uh, situations where teams are used to using subtasks in JIRA, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, this kind of approach is, uh, is put on the table to, uh, to, to your very valid point that you're kind of measuring the wrong thing with the subtasks? Is there resistance uh, in those teams to making that transition mm -hmm. and going with this model instead? There can be some, but what I try to help people remember is that we're not really trying to get rid of your ability to granularly manage your work, which is the point of the subtask. Um, we want to give you ways to do that. If it doesn't turn into a column, you know, then 
totally keep making subtasks, but when I'm but I'm tracking the movement through the board of primarily is the parent level task, the thing that you're doing the subtask for. And I, we still, on my JIRA board, because uh, we use JIRA because we code a lot for, our app is in JIRA, so we use that so we can understand how our customers work. Um, we still have some subtests from time to time and they show up on the board, but you know, if, um, like for right now, we have a video script that we wanna do for the cycle time scatter plot chart. And so we leave the, um, we leave the parent task in doing, say if we finished one subtask and done, you know, then we have some things we haven't started yet, but we started the item itself. So it's sitting there and doing, accruing time while we, you know, effectively put it on hold by not doing any more work on it or anything yet. So it's, it's important to track the parent item, but there's no reason why people can't make subtasks if they really, really want to as long as someone is making sure that you're tracking the thing that matters, right? Can and so I think it'll you, take, either? yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I use stories and subtasks and I think you can have the best of both worlds. So yeah. outcome from stories and where is work queuing? How long does it take through the subtask? So it, for the team, it's quite good to see, it, is a particular activity overheated? Is there a lot of stress? So they, they serve different purposes. I think they're both useful. Honestly, honestly, I, find, I find the columns better to show where their teams are overstressed and there's backlogs than, than subtasks. I find it gets lost in the subtasks. Yeah, mm. I think um, one way that people could use subtasks is um, obviously if, if you've got a column called creation of the thing, you don't need to make a subtask called creation of the thing because you know it's the thing's being created when it's in that column. Right, um, but you can make one if you want. Uh, but what might be really helpful is all of these exit criteria. You know, those are sort of checklist type things. And if you don't have that written on your board, a subtask is a perfect thing to do for those mm -hmm. to make sure, hey, these have all been done. Now I can move it to this. So I would, as many times as possible, I try not to make people choose. I try to make people see what thing A is good for and what thing B is good for and help them use all the different things effectively together. So, you know, and that, that was a really good question. From my perspective, um, I would want to know why we're using subtasks and, yeah. um, and, and go along that road. Mm. Yeah, and if it's valuable, then keep using it. But if it doesn't make a lot of sense, then maybe don't, and, you know, you can always do an experiment and let people prove it to themselves, but you'll probably have to help them understand some things as you're asking them to make these changes about why we need to start tracking the parent thing across the board if they haven't done that before, or you know, things like that. Um, let's dive, we can come back to more questions about this because I think there probably are some more. Let's go into some four basic flow metrics. I already talked about a few names of them, right? Um, and I'll send out, when we send out this deck and you obviously will have a video, this is a really good guide. I think it's by Yuval Uret about, um, well, actually this is the link to the Kanban guide for Scrum Team. So it's on scrumguides.org. And um, it is really sort of the guide for how to take flow and integrate that into your existing Scrum practice. And of course, nothing's as simple as a few pages on paper. So, you know, that's where we all come in talking about things and, and teaching people and trying things out in the real world. But it mentions four flow metrics that we're gonna go into. And by the way, it's, if you look at the um, Kanban guide listed on the prokanban.org website, all this material between these two guides are in sync. Uh, they match completely the same flow metrics, the same concepts. They're all sort of simpatico there. Okay. The first flow metric that um, we talk about, and probably the first one that you would use in your scrum practice is cycle time. Cycle time is a duration metric. It measures the elapsed time that it takes for your work to move from a start point to a finish point. Okay. 
Now, stepping back, you could have multiple, say you have a board and it could have 20 columns on it, right? Depending on what you need to dive into or what you need to zoom out of, you could have different start and end points for the things that you want to measure based on what you're interested in. For the purposes of Scrum, right now, we're gonna be talking about inside a sprint. So generally in this talk, the start point is gonna be your sprint backlog and the done point is gonna be your done column for the sprint, like when you call it done for the sprint, just to simplify things. But just so you know, cycle time, I mean, there's lots of different words for it, uh, different types of cycle times, flow time, lead time, cycle time, everybody's got different words for it. From my perspective, I don't care what you call it, as long as you understand what I mean, which is just an elapsed time from a start point to a finish point. And that accounts for everything that happens in between. There's gonna be idle time, there's gonna be working time, there's gonna be weekends. I mean, we are measuring elapsed calendar time because People live in calendar time. We don't live in business days, you know, uh, and we can talk about that, that more later. But cycle time can help us answer questions like, how long is it likely to take us to finish a single work item? Like if I started this sprint backlog item tomorrow, how long might it take us for it to get finished? So hopefully your brain's already churning about, ooh, that could be useful in a sprint practice. How can we make sure we get away from that cliff of despair? So we'll talk about that. And then there's this construct that sort of got personified or made or whatever in the Kanban guide for Scrum teams called a service level expectation. It's not an SLA. An SLA is something you commit to other people. The service level expectation is I'm gonna look at my data and I'm gonna see the answer to question one, how long does it generally take with a given level of confidence? And then we're going to use that as an internal sort of um, expectation for ourselves of here's the minimum of what we should expect going forward, but we can also use this as a retrospective tool and an improvement tool. Can we make this better if we don't like what it is? Okay, so let's talk about those. The best chart to use for cycle time is a cycle time scatter plot. Now you can see cycle time in histograms and all of that, but when you're looking at time series data, like when these dots were finished over time, it's better to use a chart with an axis that has time on it, because then it allows you to see patterns and clustering of what's been done. Um, and you can get everything you can get from a cycle time histogram on this chart plus more. So they're not bad. And in fact, we have one in Actual Agile, but we always recommend that people use this chart instead. So on this chart, Every one of these dots represents one or more items that were finished on a given day. So that the horizontal axis is the date that an item was finished. And how high it's placed on the chart is based on the elapsed time, it's cycle time. Right? So I can look at a dot on um, this chart and I can say, okay, this was finished on, um, let me find an easy one here. Is anything on a line? This was finished, you know, right around the end of November and it's about 17 days old. Or there were two items here, because this dot has a two on it, that finished on this day and they were about 50 days old, right? Okay, so we can learn about individual items and their age. We can look at, um, in the aggregate, what patterns do they make? Is there anything that we can notice about um, and talk about about why do we have this white space here to the left where nothing really got finished and you know in the month of July, maybe here it's Europe and so no one worked. <laughs> you know, that's what happens here in Sweden. Um, why did we have clustering here around March that we didn't have before? You, know, you have all of these conversations. Um, but the other thing that you can do is when you look at the items in the aggregate, we can see what percent of your items finish by a certain age. And then that allows us to make something called a probabilistic forecast, okay? A probabilistic forecast always has two components, a likelihood and a range. So in this slide, I'm gonna go through three different forecasts that we can pull out just by loading this chart that tells us how fast this team finishes work at different likelihoods, okay? So the first is that according to this data, this team finishes items in 16 days or less. So that's the range, 16 days or less. 
50% of the time. So that's the likelihood. Another way to say it is that we're 50% confident that when we start this piece of work, we can finish it in 16 days or less. Okay. We get that from the aggregate of all of these individual dots of cycle time. Oh, uh, we can see the 70 per percent percentile line, 32 days or less, and then 85th percentile, 85% uh, of the time we finish items within 48 days or less from the time that we started. So we can get these pretty easily. Um, it's a simple calculation. So if there are 100 dots on this chart and I wanted to find the 85th percentile, I would count the dots up from the bottom. And when I find the 85th dot, I draw a line and that's where my 85th percentile is, right? So it's, it's just a simple math thing. So you could do this by hand. You plot your cycle times, you can find your own uh, probabilistic forecast. Now, how do we turn that into an FLE, a team's expectation that they can use to help manage their flow going forward and manage their predictability going forward is, is really a thing that this is used for. Well, it's more about choosing which uh, percentile that, which, which confidence level that you're comfortable with. How important is it that, that the items fall on the happy side of this 85th percent, right? Because in this, when I tell you that 85% of the time we finish items in 48 days or less, there's still 15% of the time that we go farther than that, right? And in a probabilistic forecast, there's never such thing as 100% because something could always happen that never happened before, that couldn't be anticipated. We are doing scrum because we have uncertainty. So if we know we have uncertainty, we can't fool ourselves that we can be certain in our forecasts. Those two things have to match. We either have certainty or we don't. And when we don't have certainty, we can no longer give, there's a 100% chance that this will be done on a certain time. And then that begs the question, well, how, what percent are we comfortable with in communicating this out? Okay. Now, I have worked with Scrum teams and we'll pull up their cycle time scatter plot and they'll say, we work in two week sprints. And then we'll look at their data and say, well, actually 85% of the time you do finish work in 48 days or less, even though you tell yourself you finish work in 14 days or less, right? So immediately pulling up this chart and seeing what the percentile lines are drawn at gives you an idea of how likely they might actually finish work within a sprint. You know, if, if it's only 50% of the time they finish work in 14 days or less, then we know we've got some work to do, helping them improve their flow of their work so that they can get it completed in a sprint. Okay. Um, so we won't be happy with this actual SLE based on our data, right? So we have to think about, yes, we have this, this is what we need to improve. This is our reality, but what do we need to target, right? We know if we work in two week sprints, we at least want to finish our work in 14 days or less. That's the ultimate goal. But will 14 days or less, what kind of burn down chart would we get if it took us 14 days? It does say or less, but let's just say it took us 14 days in general to finish our work. We still get the cliff of despair, right? So even though our sprint's two weeks long, we want to finish our work even quicker than that, right? So maybe a better target SLE would be something like half as long as your sprint. So then you could start work at least halfway through your sprint and still have a good chance that it could finish within your sprint without doing crazy stuff. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Um, another, one other thing that you can really use this, well, there's more things coming soon. But another thing that we use the SLE for can be in sprint planning. When you have, obviously you need to make sure it's not gonna be any worse than your actual, which you might not be happy with, like our 48 days. Let's not make it longer than 48 days. But if we did a sniff test of this product backlog item that we're thinking about pulling into sprint planning, into our sprint backlog, do we think it'll fit within our 48 days? Well, do we think it'll fit within our 14 days? Well, what about our real target, which is seven days? And you could use that as sort of a helping tool to help you think about whether you could, should you break this work down farther, right? So um, 
we call that, I guess, right sizing is the term that's being used a lot. If it seems like it would take longer to finish than your SLE, you want to see if you can break it down into smaller, yet still independently valuable pieces. If that's the smallest it can be and still be valuable, well then fine, not everything is going to finish within one sprint, right? It just is what it is. Any questions about cycle time? The only question I have is, um, so so I get this and we kind of do a similar thing, but I was a bit surprised that we're using elapsed time mm -hmm. in that when you're in a scrum cycle, for example, you typically you lose two days because you've got your events, you know, you, you've got your start and finish and planning and, and refinement, etc. Mm -hmm. And so I typically aim for four days for cycle time, because I find that that's actually a better guide for developers. And it kind of um, takes out the time that we know we're going to spend doing things other than development. So I was just wondering whether you're- Are you, so are you talking about planning for your capacity? Like how much time you think you're gonna have to do the work? No, this is or... actual time that you have to develop because mm -hmm. you have fixed events at a certain cadence so that you're continuously, mm -hmm. you know, chunking through creating mm -hmm. flow. So you have your refinement sessions, you know, you have your sprint planning sessions, you have your retrospectives and all those things that come I in. Mean, so, so a certain amount of time is automatically taken out of your um, actual delivery time. So yeah, absolutely. Time that's left, you know, it, you know, it's just a comment um, sort of, I usually use four days um, to account for the time that's, you know, not for development. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the four days thing, but let me, let me sort of explain the thought behind why I agree with everything you said that you've got all this stuff, but I still think you should use elapsed time. Because when I tell someone, it's gonna take me um, five days to get this piece of work done. As a person I'm telling that to you, what do you hear? When do you think it's going to be done? Do you think, it, you know, if I tell you that, do you think five days from now, like five calendar days from now, it's going to be done? Yes. So I want to speak in terms of what the people I'm talking to understand and what they expect. You know internally that in that five days that I've got refinement to do, I've got this other stuff to do, et cetera. So as you're finishing work, your cycle time reflects all of that because how long it takes you to do work is impacted by the fact that you had to stop and do refinement, that you had to stop and do these other things. And so now instead of having to do super complex calculations to figure out how long it's gonna take me to do something, I can merely look at the piece of the work that I've got done took this long, given that we had all of these conditions impacting it, assuming that I will still continue to have all of these conditions impacting it. Like I have to take time for refinement. I've got weekends. I've got, you know, we don't work 24 hours a day, we go home at night, right? All of this stuff is going to impact how long it gets done and still people want to know when it will be delivered and they expect that in calendar elapsed time. So um, that it actually serves you better to account for the full elapsed time because that allows you to have a forecasting tool that takes all of that into account. Mm -hmm. When you try to strip it out, you actually make it harder for yourself to forecast because then you have to add all that back in to get the real date that something will be delivered. You try to think about the actual time you've been working on it and then add back all that other stuff. It's just extra work you don't need to do. You might do it for a different reason. You might think, out of this, and that's a whole other kind of thing you can measure, out of this elapsed time, here's the amount of time we spent actually working on it. That's a very valuable thing to understand. And then that you want to reduce the non-working time and make your cycle time smaller. So that's another thing is that if you artificially deflate your cycle times and take out all of that weight, you're actually hiding information from yourself that you can then use to improve your process, right? Um, so we could probably have a whole meetup on this 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I get your point. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I fully yeah. agree. I, I was just uh, more thinking along the, the right sizing. And, you know, if you're thinking, is it like, yeah, yeah but but I understand. What you're yeah, saying. okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, for the same reasons, I would think you, know, you could say four days, you could be whatever you want. I just put eight days up there as an example. So put whatever you want, but it's still going to be probably your elapsed time. Mm -hmm. Is a better, mm -hmm. better, easier cognitive load way to think about right. that. Right, got it. Thanks. Um. Okay. Cool. Throughput is the so second. Julia, can I just ask yeah. one question on the last slide? So, yeah, if you've got absolutely. a piece of work that, that you, you really can't break down, so yeah. it's too big. You've you've just discovered in the sprint, it's a a sixteen day task. Would you mm -hmm. classify that as a different work type? Like you could. I don't know if it matters all that much. If you really can't break it down, it's a PBI and, you know, it's still a thing that needs to get done in your sprint, just like the other things that need to get done in your sprint. Um, and when we're looking at probabilistic forecasting, we are expecting that there will be exceptions. The goal is to control the exceptions so that you don't have too many unnecessary exceptions, right? Um, because if I let too many, we're, we'll talk about this in the work item age, but if I were to let too many things go past my SLE, then that wouldn't be my SLE anymore. It's gonna get worse and worse and worse, right? Um, so you could, it might be a different work item type, but mm. in some ways it might not matter. Okay. It, it depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. Julia, sorry, can I ask you a question about it as well now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. When you say, in the last slide, when you say aim for less than eight. Yeah, this is just when, an example. By yeah, but, but we're not <laughs> talking about estimating the less than eight days. We're, there, it's all historic data that we're looking at and that's changing our SLE, isn't it? Yes. So, so you, and you, you don't know you're getting a 16 day task arriving or a 44 day task arriving. It's just that suddenly it took quite a long time. You're just trying to make them as small as you can. And then seeing you what are, the moving rate. And then this in Scrum, mm. your backlog should be estimable, right? But mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no defined way of how you should estimate things or whatever, right? It should be ordered, it should be estimable, all of that. Um, so this isn't necessarily expecting you to try to figure out exactly how many days it would take. Um, suggesting that it can be used as a tool for right sizing is more like a sniff test. Mm -hmm. Well, like something I could get done under this time or more than this time, sort of like a binary thing. If it's on the line or you aren't sure, then it's a trigger to have a conversation could this be broken down smaller? And so it's not trying to get you to a precise estimate for the thing. It's trying to help you have the conversation of when is this small enough to be good enough to start, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It is fuzzy, but it, it's sort of like a guide and not a precision laser, <laughs> you know. Um, I, if I can just add, I think I yeah. think of it sometimes as you said, small enough, which is the key bit for me, because yeah. we might be able to make it smaller, but, but is, it, is it is it really <laughs> worth it if it's small enough? So yeah. it, it's it's possible to, to make things too small and, and waste yeah. time making things too small. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to throughput, because hopefully we'll have Q&A at the end and we can go back to any parts yeah. of this. Um, so throughput is a rate metric. Uh, much like velocity, it's the rate at which something is finished. And in this case, it's the rate at which work items are finished, whereas velocity is the rate at which story points are finished. By the way, the Scrum Guide says nothing about story points, velocity, anything. You're not committing Scrum OPA if you don't use story points. I don't care if you do or you don't, but from managing flow and forecasting, um, using throughput makes a lot of sense. And there's a guy named Larry Macaroni who used to work at Rally, and he had tons of data that got, you know, sanitized, normalized, and he did um, analysis because he's a data scientist. He did analysis on velocity versus throughput and found very little difference in the accuracy of using one or the other from an estimation standpoint. And from that perspective, 
use the one that's easier to get, which by far is, you don't have to do anything to get your velocity. You just finish work and there your velocity is, right? Um, so, and we're trying to forecast things like how many work items will get done. So using a rate of how fast you finish work items has less translation that needs to try to be mapped across. Um, so probably another conversation that could be a whole thing, but let's take that sort of as the premise right now. Um, so throughput measures the rate at which you finish work items and is expressed sort of like um, I finished X stories in one, I finished two stories per, you know, in one day or 10 stories in one week or 20 stories in one sprint. So as long as you have a number of items in a time unit, you can express your throughput, you know, just sort of be consistent. Um, so yeah, one item per day, six items per week, et cetera. Now, in contrast to cycle time, which helps you understand how long it takes you to finish a single work item, because you don't need throughput to forecast how long it'll take you to finish one item. You do need throughput to help you understand how to forecast for collections of items, bodies of work, you know, how many you can do in a sprint, how, when can you get this project done, that kind of thing. That's, that's what throughput is used for. So yeah, the questions that um, we ask are, are those two things. So this is very similar to a scatter plot, except there's just one plot per time, one dot per time period. So this is a run chart. Um, it has a dot for each day or each time unit if you're using a unit different than day. And it's plotted uh, vertically according to how many items are finished that day. So whereas the height on the other chart was elapsed time, this is number of items. The higher the dot, the more items that finished in that time period. And because it's a run chart, you see the variance over time. Okay. Now it's easy to, you know, the, the first way that someone might be using this, this throughput, uh, it's much like people use velocity over time. Um, we're, we're gonna figure out the traditional way that people use throughput. So if I said, hey, you completed 12 stories in one week, we have 120 stories not yet started. When do you think, given that information, that this will be done? This 120 stories will be done. What do you think? weeks. Yeah, 10 times 12, 120, right? I mean, that's that's how I would do it if this is all the information I had and no additional tools at my disposal, right? It's better than, you know, an uninformed, yes. But there's a couple of problems with that. Um, one, we already said that we have uncertainty and 10 weeks is just one possible outcome that could happen, right? Um, <laughs> And what Dan Vacanti likes to say, he gets us from the flaw of averages, that plans based on average fail on average. So if you wanna be average, go right ahead, but you're gonna have an average result from trying to use averages. Um, and what's really fun too, is that the, the average, that 10 weeks, might not even be very likely if you were to run a simulation. Uh, let me show you what I mean. I love mathwithbaddrawings.com, great website, right? So you see here, that this, this person comes in and says, hey, what would my starting salary be? And the guy says, I'll put it this way. On average, our starting salary is $80,000. Let's look at the data points. I got hella people making $30,000 a year and one CEO son making $430,000 a year, right? So even though the average is 80,000, it showed up nowhere on any data point. Nothing, no one ever got paid 80,000. So, these are all arguments for using a better way to figure out what a forecast might be given this, uh, th these problems with averages and the fact that we, we live in uncertainty. So we can use something called a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and that is taking um, your throughput and thinking that, you know, I've got this, this throughput from all my past days, a certain number of days. And we're thinking um, any day is as likely to happen again as any other day. So it's saying, I've got a couple weeks here that I'm trying to forecast. Um, yeah, we've got 
here we're going to begin on uh, May the 9th and we're going to end on May the 23rd. And so it's, it's going to run the first trial. And for each of those days, it's going to go randomly grab one of these days up here and say, OK, today you finished 11. Oh, tomorrow you finished zero. And it's going to do that for 14 days. And then it's going to do another trial run, randomly grabbing that. It's going to do it 10,000 times minimum, right? And so what we get here is a histogram of all the different outcomes that happen. So if we're asking how many items we can get done in this two week period, um, we can see that we had things that happened all the way from just a few up to, hey, one time we got 80 things done. But those edges aren't very likely. So now we're gonna try to figure out just like we did with the cycle time histogram, what's most likely out of all of these things? Because maybe the average isn't very likely at all, right? 10, um, would probably not be very likely in, in the scenario that we have before. So we can look and say out of all of these 10,000 trials, 85% of the trials showed that we finished 25 or more items in a two week period. So that's useful in sprint planning, right? So we can say, okay, 85% of the time we finished 25 things or more, maybe we'll plan 20, 25 items, you know, you can use this to help you get an idea of how much work you want to plan. Um, yeah, so the same thing here that I think Sina said about, um, well, we've got all these other factors at play here. We've got refinement we have to do. We've got all these things that impact what our cycle times are. Now the same exact stuff's gonna happen here. We have all these conditions that impact our throughput, right? Um, we have our team size. We have our team's capacity. Are they all on vacation? We've got uh, other kinds of things like the um, combination and variety of work. We've got the size of work. We've got how many things we work on at one time. So all of these conditions can individually, so definitely collectively impact the um, underlying data that runs this simulation impact your throughput. It impacts how fast you finish work. So again, I'm gonna go back to, I don't know if I actually said it, but the underlying rule of thumb for probabilistic forecasting that you have to understand is that the conditions that you had, so all of that stuff, the conditions that you had when you generated this throughput need to be roughly similar to the time period you're trying to forecast for. So if you had a major change in your team size or you had some other major disruptive action, you know, your forecast, you're gonna to to take it with a grain of salt until you start generating data with that new set of conditions, right? You might have to fall back to a more expert estimates or, you know, trying to say, well, let's take the data from before, but let's you know, scale it down by this or scale it up by this or, or whatever. Um, but if you have roughly the same team, roughly the same conditions impacting your work, then all of those things are reflected in your throughput and therefore are valid to use to reflect in your forecast. I know that, that can feel a bit fuzzy in the head. Um, any questions about that? Nope. Cool. Okay, now there's one thing that I wanna tell you that will lead us into our next, um, our next flow metric is that if your system, if your cycle time scatter plot is just all over the board, right? Then when we try to do these forecasts with any high level of certainty, you're going to have to include more and more and more outliers and so you'll have a very wide range when we say 85% of the time, it'll take you a hundred days or less to get work done. Well, maybe a lot of work gets done in 10 days, but you've, you're accounting for all these outliers because your system's super unstable and so you've got things all over. So the best thing that you can do to help improve your probabilistic forecasts and to tighten them up and be happier with them and get people to stop complaining that you're over padding your forecasts uh, is to focus on system predictability. Predictable systems are definitely easier to forecast. Um, when Dan teaches classes with me, what he'll say is if you've got an unstable system, then pick any method to forecast, they'll be as equally bad, 
right? So if you focus on predictability, your forecasting capabilities are, are stronger. So we're gonna talk now about two other flow metrics and because I'm looking at the time too, but two flow metrics that are actually leading indicators and can help you influence future cycle time and throughput, which are the basis for our probabilistic forecasting, okay? So the first is work in progress, or the third flow metric, but the first of the leading indicators. And all this is simply the count of items that have passed the start point, but haven't yet finished. So they don't have a cycle time because they didn't hit the finish point yet, but they do have an age. So these are things that will be on your board. And, um, you know, it's simply the count. Um, because we talked about Little's Law and understand that there's a relationship between how many things you're working on and it's cycle time and throughput, um, we can understand that at a high level, generally, the more work in progress we have, the more likely each one will take longer to finish and the lower our throughput will be. This means that you can look at WIP and say, is it going up? Then I can probably expect my cycle times to get longer and my throughput to get smaller, um, you know, shortly, because it takes a minute for that to appear on your lagging data, your historical data, right? Uh, so that's a good reason we want to measure our work in progress. Yeah. Now you can look at that on a WIP run chart. It's exactly the same as the throughput run chart, but the vertical axis just means something different again. It's the amount of items you had in progress on that given day. So if you see WIP trending up like this, that's probably a sign you need to do a little investigation. Okay. We don't know if it's good or bad, but we definitely need to investigate it. Now, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can yeah. I ask a quick, quick question yeah. on, on that, Julia? Um, does the same uh, thing apply that you mentioned before? So if you're looking at uh, uh, WIP, should mm -hmm. you only focus on the backlog items? Or if you have subtasks, should you be, should you be, you know, should oh, you be discounting yeah, subtasks? All of these flow metrics, I only care about the actual valuable item. To me, the subtasks are things to help you get those valuable things done, but they're noise from a metric perspective. Right. From this, it's just tracking the things that matter. That's a great question. Um, so I don't have a problem with those, but if we start measuring those, then we start optimizing for sub value and we wanna optimize for value delivery. So we have to measure and manage at the, the PBI level, the backlog item level. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great. Okay, the best metric in the world that I came to not, you know, more recently than I'd like to admit, it's work item age. So um, it's the elapsed time since a work item started. So it's almost a cycle time, but it doesn't become a cycle time until it's finished. So if something doesn't have a cycle time, but it started, it has a work item age. Okay, so this is only measured once a work item has started. Okay. Um, so when you look at the WIP in aggregate, you, you can start to get an idea of how old your work in progress really is. And when you're just, when you're looking at your cards on a board, there's no clear way to understand exactly how old an item is. There are some things that tools have tried to do, like put little dots for days or weeks, depending on your time scale, but it's very difficult to see and really understand how old work is. So um, there's a couple things before I, I was about to jump ahead, but this chart answers the following, or this, this uh, whip answers, sorry, this metric answers questions like how old is our work in progress and what items are in case to breach our SLEs. So this chart is a work item aging chart and it's basically our board. We've got columns that is our board, right? So analysis active, analysis done, dev active, dev done, testing done, et cetera. Whatever your board is, you can do it like this. But where the dots are placed, the dots represent cards. You could have cards if you're doing this manually. You put them vertically depending on how old they are, the older ones at the top, right? So you get a visual understanding of how old each dot, which is a card, is, right? And the thing, yeah, I talked about that, I talked about that. Now, the thing that I wanna mention here is that 
we talk about age in context. Because if I just said this item 17 days old, you're like, great. I mean, I know that we have a 14 day spread, but so what else? You know, is that good? Is that bad? Is that indifferent? Is it better than before? So if we take the percentiles from our historical data, the ones that we get from the cycle time scatter plot, and we lay it over the top of this chart, then we can care about the age in context. And we can start managing these dots to improve our predictability. So if we didn't like our target SLE of 48 days, then what we need to do here is we need to draw that 48 day line, that 85th percentile line on this chart. And we need to make sure that not only, um, well, first that no more than 15% um, of our work passes that line, completes later than 48 days. But if we use this chart to start making sure that more than 85% of our dots finish before that line, then we'll start bringing that 85th percentile away from 48 days down to 45 to 40, and then over time to the place where we wanted it to be in the first place, right? Um, one thing to know is that another way to use this chart is to understand how you're pacing to get work done by this 85th percentile. Because great, now we know we don't want items to pass it, but how do we know if we're in trouble before we get over there? <laughs> so the thing to understand is that when a work, if we're looking at that 85th percentile, when a work item starts, it already has a 15% chance of missing that date, right? Because 100 minus 85 is 15. So what that means is that when this work, I, this dot right here, was, for instance, reaches this line, this is the point at which 50% of our work items have already finished. So from a mathematical perspective, a thing that I learned, again, more recently than I would like to admit, that when an item reaches that line, now the chance of it not finishing on time doubles. So if it started with a 15% chance of not finishing on time, now there's a 30% chance, and so on. Um, one thing I wish Kanban people had taught me earlier than I figured this out is that width limits are not enough on their own, okay? I could have a width limit of, uh, let's say five in this analysis done column. And I could sit here and stay within that width limit of five and you know maybe cycle these three in and out, in and out with fresh stuff and let these two sit here and age and age and age, right? But I'm still in my width limit of five. I've got no visual indicators that stuff is happening that's bad. But over time, if I let things artificially age and I don't monitor and control for age, my predictability is shot, right? Um, however, if I had started with watching age, I would probably eventually get to the fact that I need whip limits. And I need other things like controlling the size of work and controlling other things that would help reduce work item age. Because there's a thousand things you could do to keep work items from aging unnecessarily. Um, so that's something interesting is that if you start with age, you'll probably get to whip limits. But if you start with whip limits, you may never get to age. So care about work item age. <laughs> that's really, really important. Um, again, so, um, when you say yeah. um, age, do you just mean then in progress age also from yes. creation? Um, in, in this context, I'm not caring about from creation, I'm caring from when it actually started. So a start point to an end point are the frames for all of these flow metrics. They're, once you agree on a start point, which for this conversation is when it exits the sprint backlog to um, the end point when it enters the done column, um, that's where you're going to measure your age from passing the start, you know, until you get to finish. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so those are our four flow metrics. We've got cycle time, throughput, whip, and with age. We talked about this as we've gone through, so I don't think this will be too much of a surprise, um, but we need to think about where we might use each one. I mean, this is talking about how Scrum teams can benefit from using flow metrics. Um, so the first thing that we do is to think about, well, what's the point of each of these sprint events anyway, right? What questions do we want to have answered? If we think about what, we, what question we need to answer, then we can think about 
um, what data we might need to answer that question. And instead of starting with, we've got these metrics, where can we use them? Right? We need to go the other way and say, we've got these questions, what can help us answer them? Right. So sprint planning is to decide what will get done and how it will be achieved. So um, definitely throughput, right? We might care about, well, we care about um, cycle time. I, I didn't put it on this chart. We care about cycle time and that it gives us the SLE, which might help us with our sprint planning. So I should put a key in there as well. Now for daily scrum, what's the first thing that pops to your mind about which flow metric might be most helpful in a daily scrum? With age. Absolutely. And with, right? Those two things together are leading indicators or the things that we are monitoring on a daily basis, right? Those are the things we can actively manage and control. The other two happen because of what we actively manage and control. So every time we meet to be proactive, we care about our, our leading indicators and we can manage those. And then when we go to sprint reviews, um, where we inspect the increment and adapt the product backlog and talk with our stakeholders. Again, there's some forecasting there of maybe some release planning, right? That might happen. So we care about our throughput. Maybe still also we might care about our SLE. Um, but then the sprint retrospective, um, it's a looking back. So we're looking back at a lot of our flow metrics. But honestly, WIP should be in here too. Um, why might you look at WIP on, in a um, retrospective? Your, you know, your trend of WIP over time, how could that be helpful? Does that try to identify any bottlenecks in your process? If you typically have high WIP, maybe you need to look into which part of the process is causing it. Yeah, I, I think uh, you could, it could help you determine if that was a cause of your bottleneck. So if you think about that relationship of Little's Law, cycle time throughput and WIP, when we look back um, in order to help triangulate problems, it would be good to look at things either separately or together that show your cycle time, your throughput and your WIP. So, hey, our cycle time got worse. Well, did our WIP get higher? Was that maybe a correlation there that we could dive into you know, and things like that? So I need to add a key to the, the WIP one as well. Um, and again, you can use any metric in any event, as long as you understand what it tells you, you're not fooling yourself about what it tells you and it's helping you answer a question or make a decision. These are generally the ones that people tend to use where. Um, and when we think about what that means from a chart, because one metric can be shown in many ways on in different visualizations. So in your sprint planning, you're gonna you know, use your throughput run chart, but even better, use the simulation, the Monte Carlo simulation that takes your throughput and gives you a probabilistic answer of what might be done. Um, same thing for sprint review. Those are very similar events, but with a different lens. Um, and then again, your daily scrum, the, you know, the item aging chart, it's a lot like your board suit. So that's definitely something you could pull up in your daily scrum. And then your sprint retrospective, um, you might look at the scatter plot, you might look at the throughput run chart, and you might look at the cumulative flow diagram, which shows you together cycle time, throughput, and whip, sometimes in averages and approximate averages, but gives you enough to see that relationship. And you could also look at a whip run chart. Um, yeah, I've, I've got some recommended reading here that will be in here, so we don't need to go over there, but I did want to you know, we've got, I think about 10 minutes, well, maybe less if there's announcements, but we've got some time for questions that we didn't get to during the talk. So I wanted to see what other questions that I could answer or try to answer. Cause I'm not like the all knowing person. I'm on a journey too. So I'll give you the best that I know. And um, yeah, we can learn together. So can I, can I chuck some stuff in? Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm coming from a place of, um, uh, I, I use actual agile analytics. I've been using it for, for a long time and um, practicing awesome. flow in my teams and stuff. And, um, but I think in terms of this talk, I think, I think there are some caveats though. I mean, um, cycle time scatter plots are useless unless you've got 
the, um, the, the assumptions met that Little's Law needs. So, you know, with any mathematical proof, there are assumptions which make that thing a proof. So Little's Law has these assumptions and they have to be met before you can start to say things like there's an 85% chance that this item will get done by this date because it needs to be stable, right? So- um, No, that's, and that's not actually true. Your data is showing you the likelihood that if you maintain the same rough conditions that you had before, whether they're stable or not, that that is the likelihood that you'll finish your work. In, in other words, if this was what we could do before, what did we change to think we could do anything different? And if we haven't changed, it's likely to be the same. Now, to be able to use Little's Law as a formula, there are conditions that need to be met, right? Um, and that's why no one ever meets those conditions. So we definitely say you can't plug in your cycle time and your throughput and figure out what whip you need or vice versa. Um, and we do say that if your system is completely unstable, um, like I was saying before, um, that means when you use these probabilities, they're going to have a lot of padding room in them, which is maybe what you mean when you're saying they're useless, because sometimes if I need to be 85% certain, I'm going to overinflate the estimate, the forecast that I give for many, many, many of my items that could finish much faster, right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't start using it. But I would say that if, you're go if you have a completely unstable system, before I started using the, um, the you know, Monte Carlos or whatever, I would focus on work item age to try to get more stability in my system and then move to really diving into the, the, the probabilistic forecast. However, in order to really control your work item age and use the helpers, you have to at least pull whatever your SLE was, your historical data, even if it's crappy to give you a frame of reference to know if you're improving it or not. If that makes sense. Yeah, I get that. Um, yeah. It's just that if, you're, if your work in progress is fluctuating over any period of time, right? So if it's, if it, like on your run chart, you know how you have this thing going up and up and up and up. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that in yeah. itself is, is making your system unstable from a forecasting yes. perspective, right? So if, yes. you're then, if you then want to stand up in a meeting and say there's an 85% chance that when we start this piece of work, you'll get it done in 12 days or less, if at the mm -hmm. same time your work in progress is fluctuating wildly and going up, then, the, then yeah. that confidence is actually, like you said, it's actually overinflated, isn't it? Because as soon as yeah. someone takes on more work, then that confidence is going to drop again. You're Sorry. right. Like I, I get what you're saying. Uh, you've, he's got a very good point, everyone, that if, if your system is unstable and it's on a trend to get even more unstable, then your rough conditions that you had for the data you'd forecast won't match the conditions for the period of time you're forecasting. So you're not wrong. Um, it's, you, you have to sort of use them in tandem. Right, like you can't just forecast and not care about system stability. But that doesn't mean you can't try to forecast even if your system's unstable, if you're trying to actively start to create a stable system. But yeah, if, you, if you're not caring about stability at all, I guess I go back to what Dan says, then any method is gonna be as bad as any other method. <laughs> I, I think it's also that you, your forecast isn't a one-off event. Where, no, it's where, a continuous. So you should yeah. be continuously forecasting. At that point, you will see that that percent confidence is changing over time, and then you can yeah. ask why that's changing over time. And, Thank and you for that. I totally forgot to say that. That's really important. Julia, one of the one of the things I'm interested in, I, I tend to be looking things from the product owner, product manager side of things, yeah. and when 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 we work closely with the scrum master. Obviously, I'm represented as the, from the product management side. I'm representing the other shareholders, stakeholders, and I make sure they're involved, have their input. The same for the scrum master representing the DevOps teams, the developers, mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. We want to all use as one version of the truth. 
So I need to make sure that my JIRA boards, which we tend to use, get rolled up in different ways. And I actually, like you say, want to see how close am I getting to actually delivering an outcome that my customer wants. And that might be a product. It might be a, a product upgrade, a product, product in, incremental. Mm -hmm. One of the things I can get concerned about is poor estimation of what are within the scrum teams of how long tasks are going to take. And I know from the fact that when we put a new teams together, their estimation is going to be pretty poor to start off with, and it gets better as you go on. But what worries me sometimes is I go to a, a, a sprint retrospective and we talk about all these metrics and all these things. And I'm saying, okay, guys, I love everything you've got here. But at the end of the day, the outcome is this. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind if they take my epic, break it down into stories, make it, make, break it down to multiple tasks. In fact, I like them to break it down into the smallest deliverable possible, because that mm -hmm. way we might have a better chance of actually reducing our work in progress, getting better flow, getting better balance in the team. Um, More importantly, having earlier inspect and adapt capabilities to make sure you're making well, the right it, thing. It, yeah, yeah, that's basically at the end of the day, it does depends how your, your DevOps or architecture is set up. There's continuous improvements, integration, development, deployments, yeah? You know, mm -hmm. we work in some pretty rigid scrums, but it's still a product team with the scrum master, and those sprint retrospectives, sprint mm -hmm. planning, that make sure that we then get things delivered on time. And there, there needs to be changes from week to week to week to week, or oh, from sprint to sprint to sprint. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how much that buggers up for your metrics. I'm not quite sure if I understand what's changing so from week I, to week I, to week that you were talking about. In a business, we're faced mm -hmm. with changes and quite often it comes to next week's, we do our sprint retrospective, we come to the print planning stage and I say, well, hang on a moment, sorry, we've got seven teams working on the development of this product. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of them working on their particular, particular aspect of this product. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually need to divert one team away. What's the impact going to be? Yeah. And sometimes measuring that totally can screw up the, the way the metrics come out of your JIRA boards. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about so, the metrics coming out of the JIRA boards, but... Um, but there's, there's, there's some yeah. of the ones you've shown me. Mm. Yeah. But what I was going to say is that... Um... Andrew, aren't you just saying, if I fundamentally change my delivery set setup on a bi-weekly basis, is it not, is it st can I still make it predictable? And the answer is yeah. probably no, you can't. No, you <laughs> can't fundamentally great. change yeah. it every two yeah. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, exactly. Thank you. That was helpful. <laughs> but what I'm saying I don't is, have to answer every question. If I'm going to be agile, there'll be times when yeah. things change. Yeah, on a absolutely. Weekly basis. Yeah, so I, there I, are ways to, um, so here's the thing. If you change your situation, you have to use a best effort until you get new data, right? Mm -hmm. So there are ways in these Monte Carlo simulations, regardless of which one you use, if you use choice spreadsheet, if you use actionable agile, if you use whatever, um, that you can scale throughput. So you think I'm removing a team, so that's going to cut my throughput. I'm I'm making a hypothesis here because I don't actually know, right? But it's going to cut my throughput by this percentage. So let me scale back my throughput, run it through the simulator and see what happens. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is give you ways to get as accurate or better forecasts with less effort so you can spend more time doing the work. Um, because people sitting down and trying to do work breakdowns and figuring out is never right either. So we want to spend less time and get as answers that are as good as the traditional ways, if not better. It, it's cool. interesting, Thank Andrew, what you said, because that also is similar, although not the same as, um, you know, I had a question from a director saying, will this, <clears throat> will this product get done by January next year? Right. So I ran it through Monte Carlo just to just to entertain him. 
Um, it came out like, you know, there's an 85% chance we'll get this number of items done in 570 days, right? So his first reaction is, oh, we need to spin up some more teams to get all that work done. But the key that I had to remind him about was that we don't have 576 days worth of data in which to make a forecast 576 days ahead of time. And it, that's a bit of a, that's a silly way of saying it, but basically the longer range that your forecast is going to be, especially if you've got a portfolio of projects is um, more uncertain you it yeah the uncertainty just rapidly increases so it is about what you said which is like having to make the changes that you're talking about you know which might be happening every few weeks maybe, you know, maybe not but then you have to let the system produce the data in which you can then use to make your predictions so it's like you have to let the teams generate 10 done stories before you can then look at that data and then say this is the impact that it is going to have you know so or you don't look at the data and you simply try to make a prediction, but then your confidence is going to be lower. So, you know, and yeah. I think the hard part for stakeholders is like, is selling them the fact that they need to have patience that if they're going to change the system, as in change the team, they have to let it run to actually make the data in which you can then make a better forecast. I'm, I'm going to jump in here. Um, yeah. we're, we're at half past the hour, so I think we could probably talk about this all night forever um, so, so so apologies for interrupting the conversation is really it's really good stuff to talk about i love this stuff um you know it's really really interesting so um but i'll i'll shut myself so um thank you julia i think you've you put up a slide with where people can contact you um i'm sure you've and you a know, promo code yeah. <laughs> so we'll send this out yeah yeah, absolutely. Uh, try these things out. And, and, you know, I'm sure, Julie, you're available for kind of questions offline as well. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I shall stop the recording and then we'll just do a kind of few closing announcements.